wants their life as it quite clearly has done, and that they can have a birthday party uh, without ending up in hospital, that uh, they can attend school and not have to drop out because they're not well, and, they can and that they can have a semblance of normality. That is what I support and will continue to support, and there's a very, very clear line of difference between the two. Thank you. Ronnie Cowan. Thank you very much, Mr Howarth, and uh, I genuinely thank the one member from Mansfield for bringing this topic back to this place, because as he correctly points out, we have to raise the profile of this issue. We all have it, throughout the United Kingdom and beyond, and pushing it away and not discussing it is not going to do anybody any good any time. And having heard what's been discussed here this morning, we agree and probably more than we disagree, and this is sort of turning into Groundhog Day because we've had this conversation, we agree that there is no silver bullet. We agree that these drugs cause enormous damage. We agree there is an enormous strain on our local services. Where we disagree is on the effect that reclassifying these drugs all have. I repeat what I said at the start, reclassifying SCRAs as a Class A drug will not grant any additional enforcement powers to the police. It may make it easier for a police force to say, well, it's now it's a Class A drug so we can reprioritise, but it doesn't give them any extra powers. This classification is all about longer sentences. The proposed solution is to send problematic users with some with serious mental health issues to overcrowded, understaffed prisons, which are, as has been pointed out already, full of synthetic drugs. I don't see how that can possibly end well. We're told that we're not trying to prosecute the end user. We're trying to prosecute higher up the chain by making it a Class A drug. So what are we doing? Are we going to leave the, the end users on the streets? We've heard how unpleasant we find that, how unpleasant our society finds that, how intolerant we are to people who've got mental health issues. So we're not going to arrest these people. Then why are we doing this? To chase it further up the strain, up, up the chain? Because if that worked, longer sentences for those with a Class A drug, we wouldn't have a heroin or a cocaine problem. Because we've tried that. We've tried it for years. It didn't work. We're going down the same path again. I'd like to thank Transform, Lisa and Vote Fast for the information they've given me prior to this debate. And I'm going to quote from a Vote Fast report here. Dr. Rob Ralphs, a senior lecturer in criminology at Manchester Metropolitan University, has researched spice in prisons and within the homeless community. He believes that making spice Class A will make no real difference to its use, but may make the situation worse. While the market for spice is at present relatively stable, with four or five different strains of the drug in circulation, he said its potential reclassification could drive innovation, leading to new strains being developed to circumvent it. Well, this is what's happened in the past. Every time, every time there's been a change in the law, the next generation has been even stronger. The big thing, the question we should be asking ourselves is, is why is the homeless and the prison populations using this drug in the first place. We should be putting money into engaging people into treatment services and trying to reduce the market. If you can reduce the market, the demand for it, then you will reduce the problem. <coughs> Professor Harry Sumner, who specialises in substance use at Liverpool John Muir's University for Public Health Institute, also believes reclassification could make the problem with spice worse. When you take a police-orientated approach to a complex health and social issue, you can never address the fundamental root causes of why some cities in the UK are experiencing harms with these substances. I don't think the emergence of spice and the concentration of harms in some uses of spice is down to the fact that the police aren't arresting enough dealers. I don't accept the fact that the police can't arrest people or are unlikely or unwilling to prioritise the pursuit of dealers because it's a Class B there's nothing to stop police priorities in dealers or users of spice. Excuse me. He went on to say, the harms associated with heroin and crack cocaine 
haven't been resolved by the fact that they are Class A drugs, and that focusing on targeting dealers with harsher penalties would not lead to users being safer or healthier. There's a part that's safer, because when we try to chase these things up the chain, as we've said we're trying to do, drug dealers protect their marketplace with incredible violence. If they feel threatened by the fact that their users are put under more pressure, that level of violence will escalate. Criminologists would argue that actually makes the market more harmful because of the risk increase. The price of drugs increase, which makes the market more profitable. The more profit involved, the more violence used to protect it. The types of organised crime groups that might then enter the market because the profits and risks are higher, and when that happens, violence and secondary harm increases. Professor Sumno believes the call to make Spice Class A are a symbolic response to the issue, which doesn't actually translate into any meaningful public health action unless there's a real commitment to ensure good coverage of high-quality services for these individuals. I'll go back to this letter we've got signed by 20 policing crime commissioners. And quite correctly, as pointed out, there's a line in this letter which says... We would urge that synthetic cannabinoid products are reclassified from Class B to Class A. It says that 20 police and crime commissioners. But also in this letter, five times it says public health concern, an urgent public health issue, most severe public health issue, as public health and substance misuse services are not currently taking the lead in meeting this growing challenge, it falls upon us. To public health, to mental health and addiction services. It absolutely categorically says this is a public health issue and it says those who should be addressing it aren't addressing it. And the reason they're not addressing it, within the broader context of the failings in the criminal justice system, the fact that mental health services provision is in crisis, that local areas are experiencing around about 30% cut in treatment budgets. Those are the fundamental issues that need to be addressed rather than a totemic, symbolic response by making a Class A drug. The blame lies here. The blame lies within Parliament. The Parliament's Science and Technology Committee reported, in their reports on making a hash of it, concluded that the classification system is not fit for purpose. Harms of different drugs often bear little resemblance to their status in the ABC system, which has been distorted by political considerations and doomed attempts to send a message. And that was written in 2006, and we're none the wiser. So what can we do about this? Plenty of options open to us, and plenty of examples around the world. I spoke last week to Nuno Capes from Portugal. I asked him a very straightforward question. Is there a synthetic cannabis problem in Portugal? And his answer was short and sharp and to the point, no. So how come Portugal can get this right and we're getting it so wrong? Canada's example, legalise and regulate cannabis. In the Netherlands, because cannabis is legally available, the market for spice is almost non-existent. People prefer the real thing. So demand never developed, as in Canada, Uruguay in many US states. And as a slight subtext to that, I would say last week, I've forgotten his name, Prime Minister Trudeau said, We are not legalizing cannabis because we, we think it's good for our health. We're doing it because we know it's bad for our children's health. And that is a mindset we have to adapt, adopt. So, in conclusion, to improve life opportunities for people who use SCRA, it's imperative that we properly fund schemes around employment, education and housing. People who use SCRAs should be diverted away from the criminal justice system. The diversion scheme in Durham, called Checkpoint, diverts people after arrest on the condition that they undertake a four-month programme to address their offending behaviour. As long as they comply there will be no criminal record. Some initial findings from the pilot period found that those who are diverted to checkpoint had lower reoffending rates compared to those who are subject to out-of-court disposals such as cautions. Participants in checkpoint also reported improved outcomes in relation to substance misuse, alcohol misuse, accommodation, 
relationships, finances and mental health. Is that not what we are trying to achieve? We cannot ostracise a subsection of our citizens and drive them into more damage by pushing them into the criminal justice system. But what we all agreed we're trying to do is provide better social services, a wraparound service, and the only way that will ever happen is if we buy into that concept and it's properly funded by this government. <laughs>